Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Bridge Library event, which is part of our Nature Season, The Natural Word. My name is Maya Marito, which I'm Head of Higher Education and Science at the Bridge Library, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this conversation where we're looking how to harness the power of fiction in the fight against the climate crisis. Just before this, we start, before I introduce our chair, Claire Armstead, I'm just going to give you a few points of housekeeping for uh, this event. Um, we will be asking questions at the end of this event. So if you'd like to ask one, you will going to form, you're going to find a form just below this video where you can do that. Also below the video, you will find links where you can find more about all our speakers for tonight. And also you will find a link for a very exciting postcard from the future project by our partners, the State University of Arizona. And we're going to tell you about this uh, later as well. Above the video, you can uh, leave us your feedback. You can watch our previous events, maybe not just now, but uh, you can certainly go back to that and you can donate to the British Library. So um, that's all housekeeping uh, from us. And now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our chair, Claire Armstead. Uh, Claire was born in South London and spent her early years in Northern Nigeria. Uh, today, she's associate editor of culture the Guardian newspaper and has works as arts editor, literary editor and head of books. She presents the weekly Guardian book po po podcast and is a regular commentator on radio. Claire also leads workshop and chairs literary events in the UK around the world and we are very very uh, glad and delighted that she's doing that with us uh, today. So without further ado I'm going to hand over to Claire. Thank you very much, Maya. I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled to be involved in this project because um, I've been doing a lot of thinking around it recently, as I'm sure anybody with half a conscience and half a brain has been doing. And um, so it is fantastic to see um, the University of Arizona and the British Library partnering to encourage a new generation of thinking to come through, because as we will hear a bit later on, um, it hasn't all, this hasn't always been the case. And we've been perhaps a bit slower off the mark um, than we might have been. Anyway, um, I'm not going to do the first introduction. I'm going to leave this to one of the instigators of, of this initiative, Ed Finn. Um, and Ed is um, the founding director of the Center for Science and the Imagination at Arizona State University, where he's an associate professor in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society and the School of Arts, Media and Engineering. He also serves as the academic director of Future Tense, a partnership between ASU, New America and Slate magazine and is a co-director of Emerge, an annual festival of our art, ideas, and the future. So he's pretty much got it all taped. <laughs> um, his research and teaching involves uh, working with the imagination, with digital culture, with creative collaboration, and at the intersection of the and the intersection of the humanities, arts, and uh, sciences. Um, his books include What Algorith Algorithms Want, Imagination in the Age of Computing, and he's co-editor of Future Tense Fiction, Frankenstein annotated for scientists, engineers, and creators of all kinds, which sounds like the sort of book that should be next on my reading list, Ed. Um, welcome. <laughs> Hi, Claire. Thank you so much uh, for, for moderating this and for welcoming us to this wonderful event, this conversation today. Really excited to be here. I want to talk a little bit about the Climate Imagination Fellowship, which is the project and the, the fellows we're going to be hearing from later today. And our inspiration for this was, was really exactly what you were saying a minute ago. We've been thinking about climate for a long time. Many of us have been uh, worried about it. And even the people who are in the trenches trying to make changes, uh, battling over policy, battling over carbon parts per million and all of these different issues, often struggle to articulate a positive vision of the future we're working towards. You know, we are so worried about all the bad things that might happen. Uh, that sometimes it can feel too complicated, too overwhelming. What can one individual do? What are What is a path forward? How do we actually grapple with a crisis at a planetary scale? So we have this real need, this desperate need for positive climate futures, for positive imagination. And writers like Amitav Ghosh have talked about how we, in a lot of ways, what we're contending with here is our own failure of imag imagination, the crisis of imagination around climate and positive planetary futures. So this aligns with the mission of our center, which is to inspire collective imagination for better futures. And what we've done is we've identified these four fantastic writers around the world, uh, three of whom will be joining us today, to 
write positive climate futures, connecting with different communities and regions around the world, not just so that we get some stories, some possible visions, not because these are crystal balls about what's going to happen, but so that they can expand our thinking about the possibility space, and most importantly, fire our own imaginations to inspire communities around the world to start asking, well, what are we working towards? What do we want to the future to look like? And obviously, it's not going to be uh, unicorns and, and sunshine all the time. Well, maybe a lot of sunshine, certainly here in Phoenix. Uh, things will be hard, and we will have to adapt. We will need to to uh, fall back on human resilience and the resilience of communities. But we need to understand what the positive visions of the future are that we can work towards. And that's how we motivate real change in the present. You know, we can't only do this through fear and anxiety. We also have to have hope. It's maybe the most fundamental human thing that we all share. So uh, these writers are engaging not just in in writing stories that we're gonna be compiling into a, a book uh, that will come out next year, but also engaging in conversations like this, meeting with policymakers and climate experts, scientists and other researchers. Uh, and what we're hoping to do through all of these efforts is to inspire positive futures uh, that other people come up with in the present. And so we hope also that uh, people in the audience today will take our, our call to action and, and take a little step, write a postcard uh, at the end of this event. So all of this will come together, uh, different outcomes from workshops and gatherings and, and conversations and the, the wonderful work that our writers are doing in a climate action almanac that we're hoping we can put out uh, by, by Earth Day of next year. So uh, with that, I think I've said enough. I'm so excited to uh, see the conversation unfold today. And again, delighted to be here with all of you. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, now I'm just going to briefly introduce our three, um, the three participating fellows, um, beginning with Hannah Onogwe. Are you there, Hannah? You could show your face and give us a wave. <laughs> so those people who can't see you on, 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 on uh, Zoom. Um, Hannah is a writer based in the south of Nigeria, an area which is um, well known for its oil industry. She's been published in Imagine Africa 500 and Strange Lands Short Stories. In 2014, her collection Cupid's Catapult was one of 10 manuscripts chosen for the Nigerian Writers Series. And in 2016, she won the ANA Poetry Competition. In 2020, she was longlisted for the Afritondo Short Story Prize. So Hannah, you're a, a real all-rounder and boy, do we need people who make those sort of connections between, <laughs> between all the different genres. Welcome. Thank I can't you. actually see you on my screen, but I, I trust you're there. I know you're there. In the back. <laughs> I am. <laughs> <laughs> good to, very good to see you. Um, next, um, I, I, I will turn to Libya Brenda. Uh, Libya, welcome. Um, Libya Hi, is thank you. Oh, you've come very quickly up on the screen. Brilliant. <laughs> it's a, and Olivia is a, a writer, an editor, and a translator based in Mexico City. She's a co-founder of the Cumula de Tesla Collective that promotes dialogue between the arts and the scientists, sciences, and was the first Mexican woman to be nominated for a Hugo Award for her anthology, A Larger Reality, which in Spanish is, oh, I don't know whether I'm even going to try that one, I'm afraid, Lydia, I will embarrass myself. Um, Don't in, worry. <laughs> in 2020, uh, she edited the Mexico special issue of the speculative fiction magazine Strange Horizons. So I, I'm expecting a, a, a very particular perspective from you about this extraordinary snobbery, which Amitav has identified as one of the problems of the literary ecosystem. Um, um, so welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Our third um, fellow is Vandana Singh. Vandana? Are you going to come and give us a wave? She is here. I know she's here. <laughs> um, Vandana uh, was brought up in New Delhi and lives near Boston, Massachusetts. She's a writer, professor of physics, and professor of physics at Framingham State University, and an interdisciplinary researcher on the climate crisis. She's the author of two collections: "The Woman Who Thought She Was a Planet" and other stories from 2014, and "Ambiguity Machines" and other stories from 2018, which was a finalist for, for the Philip K. Dick Award. So, again, another person who ventures beyond the, the enclaves of the, beyond the ivory tower and comes back with the, all the important news. Uh, I, I would repeat what um, Ed said that we will be hearing um, from Amitav Ghosh a bit later in the programme um, 
for, um, in a, a little interview we did earlier because he's unavailable today. Um, and he, and he, as he, I'm sure you will all know, has become a really important thinker in the area of climate change and the literary imagination, and particularly in regard to the great derangement, climate change and the unthinkable, which was published in 2016, and which he has since followed up with a novel which answers some of his provocations. And he's just about to publish The Nutmeg's Curse, where he's turning to nonfiction to put this whole great crisis we're facing in its, its true political historical um, context. Um, but first, I'd like to ask a very general question to each of the fellows in turn, and that is, what does the word cli-fi mean to you? Now, I, I did some research on this, and I gather it only actually made it into the mainstream in 2007. Um, it mainstream media by 2007. So um, yes, what is it? Is it just a gimmicky word? Does it, it does it mean anything? Um, who's going to start? <laughs> Livia, you are on my screen, so why don't you go oh. first? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think at least for us, maybe in our conversations, and I know that for me, climate fiction or cli-fi it's uh, sort of a way of writing and making art uh, from a speculative fiction perspective that focuses on the climate crisis, which means that uh, includes uh, maybe reflections about what is happening right now, but it has been happening for years, of course. So right now, I think it's a hot topic, like in the in the general culture. But science fiction and speculative fiction, and a lot of writers uh, that are not um, realists, ha have been writing and and making uh, making uh, reflections about the subject uh, from years now. I will dare to say that the world for world is forest from Ursula K. Le Guin could be climate fiction today, and it's completely, uh, completely, um, you know, present. I, I, I don't remember the word in English, but it's vigente right now. So that's my very short answer. I'm now going, sorry, I've muted myself. I'm now going to move to Vandana um, to ask Vandana to unpick a little bit this idea of science fiction versus speculative fiction, uh, which I know is something that has come up a lot around um, in, the, in the last few 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 years, but particularly in, in relation to the work of Margaret Atwood. Um, do you have anything to add? Yeah, yeah, actually, um, that's, that's an interesting uh, distinction, but people make it in different ways. Uh, you know, Margaret Atwood has, at least in the past, famously uh, distanced herself from science fiction and said that what she writes is speculative fiction. Um, I don't know if she's changed her perspective since that time. Uh, there are uh, probably as many definitions of these as there are people working in the area. For me, and I know that others, many others share this, speculative fiction is an umbrella word that includes science fiction, fantasy, magic realism, uh, you know, all of the, all of the, what I call imaginative literature under one umbrella. Um, and, and it, and there's a, there's a great literary tradition in speculative fiction, uh, which I think is, you know, to go back to what you said earlier about snobbery is, is not acknowledged uh, in the literary mainstream, what I call the literary mainstream genre. <laughs> so, uh, which is a pity because a lot of really interesting conversations and experiments in, in fiction have been going on for quite a while in, in under speculative fiction umbrella. Thank you very much. Um, Hannah, um, I know Nigeria is making, is doing, there's some really interesting science fiction coming out of Nigeria at the moment. Um, yes. Where do you stand on this issue? Well, um, it's interesting, like, Previous, I don't. I haven't always thought of myself as a science fiction writer, and it goes back to I think the snobbery thing again. You know, I've heard them say, or maybe maybe the West say, why would we talk about science fiction when we don't have you know going to our normal everyday lives? We don't seem to have a lot of um, scientific um, labs and things going on. You know to 
fund, to fund all those um, imaginations. I read like one of Wanda's um, articles, I think, where she said, we have no imagination, you know? <laughs> so it, 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 it's, it's interesting that we have come to the point where writers, speculative fiction writers here are saying, you know what, no matter what they say, we are going to write what we want to write. We have all kinds of speculative fiction coming out. And we're just going to do what, regardless of what people think. So we have a lot of new writers mixing genres. And although yes, like the umbrella speculative fiction is, you just have a lot of work coming out. I think going beyond the limitations of what people expect and what people think to bring out work that is remarkable. So I think whatever our roots or origins, we go for it. And I think over the past few years, it has really grown tremendously. Yeah, uh, no, I, I want to, sort of leading on from that, I'd like to ask about w whether you think literature is actually important or whether we should all be putting down our pens and going and sitting on barricades or manning, you know, going and out to sea to rescue all the refugees who, who, who've lost their homes. Do, is, well, what no. is the importance of it? It's important because it's one, I think like growing up with literature, even as a child, one of the main things was escape. So you, you can't put it down and say, oh, the, the themes have become too heavy and they're not important and there are a lot of things on ground. Even those um, scenarios you've described, refugees and so on, they get some sort of consolation from literature. And I think we should put, it's, it's more, I think it's more important now because more people read it with technology, it goes, it goes around faster. You don't have to wait for your library to open, you know, and then you go borrow books. You have access to all kinds of stories, short stories and novels. In the most unlikely places, you can find all kinds of things. So I think you can try and find a balance. Even as we do the humanitarian work, we can also push literature and the great, great good that it can do, you know, for us. Libya, uh, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think that even if we, wanted to just sit and, and put down our pens or our computers, that's impossible. We are always going to tell stories. As human beings, stories are part of ourselves and it's part of our brain. And we need stories to understand the world better. So I think in that regard, literature is never going to disappear. Doesn't matter if it is in a screen, in a paper, or if it is, you know, mouth to ear. Literature and stories are always embedded on us. I just uh, watched a, a video um, that Neil Gaiman was talking about, uh, Neil Gaiman stuff, and he was talking about how stories can, um, can behave like uh, living things because it, they grow and they change and they evolve. Uh, we are telling the same stories uh, that we were uh, telling 4,000 years ago. And science fiction, of course, uh, retell also those types of stories. And that is very important. As human beings, we need art. It's, we are animals. And there are, uh, I hope we understand that, that we are animals, because we can see animals in a different light and not just like beings uh, b below us. But the little things that uh, that separate us from animals, one of those things is art. So I think art, it's like, it's necessary. It's part of our life, even if it's not uh, art, uh, like in the light of Snowberry or uh, art, uh, uh, understand it like something high or intellectual. Art is art and imagination and stories are part of our daily lives. Mm -hmm. So they're never going to disappear. They are going to be necessary as humans remain. Uh, so I think we are doing what we have to do, you know, like we are meant to do this. I don't know, maybe it's a metaphysical answer. So, so um, uh, Vandana, I'd like to ask you a little, to drill down into this a little bit beneath us. So we, we know that we are, we are a storytelling creature. Um, that's that's sort of one of the things about the, our possession of consciousness. But how do we how do we use these stories to address politics, science, or and lo on a local and on a global level? Um, yeah, that's that's such an important point. Uh, what do stories do when they're let loose into the world? And 
you know, there is no one direct connection or there's no simple linear connection between the release of a story from a writer's brain and some impact so that we know that the way stories work is much more subtle and organic and syncretic. Um, but having said that, um, you know, and remembering, for instance, that during the Occupy movement, one of the books that was being passed around, you know, from camp to camp was Ursula Le Guin's famous book, The Dispossessed. Um, and, you know, so so stories do impact the world. And uh, although the way they do it is, like I said, not a simple linear process, but particularly what imaginative fiction does, what speculative literature can do, is that because it makes the familiar seem strange and the strange seem familiar by immersing us in alternate realities, it, it throws us out of the trap of the imagination, which is part of the reason why uh, the climate problem has not been um, solved uh, as yet. We have not learned how to engage with it uh, because it confounds all our frameworks. And what imaginative literature does is to, is to uh, put us in a different world altogether. So we suddenly realize that the default reality that we think is reality and the only way to be is actually just a construction. And so we can construct something better. Uh, that I think is the unique uh, gift and the revolutionary potential of speculative fiction. Um, so, and of course, being story, all the various different threads, science, art, politics, uh, all come together, just like in the real world. So, uh, so I do believe that that's, that's something that, that emerges naturally from story, but particularly with that special superpower that uh, speculative literature has. And continuing on from that, and now I'm going to ask each of you, and we'll, we'll start with you, Vandana, since you're here at the moment. Um, what are you doing with this? What, well, how are you going to address this in your project for this initiative? <laughs> uh, um, I'm, uh, well, let me give you a, a little bit of a general idea, and then I'll give you a hint, because I'm a little afraid of, of uh, talking too much about my story in case it slips away from me. Um, I don't know if that's a... If, if that's a reasonable um, thing or a, or a kind of superstition I have. Uh, but in general, the way that it comes to me is through a character and a landscape because landscape speaks to me. And my academic work on climate where I engage with the science uh, talks to the part of me that is the imaginative storytelling part. Uh, so, so in a way, I think of the climate itself as teacher. And, uh, you know, places I've gone to for academic work, you know, whether it's in, in Charkhand in India or Alaska, the North Shore of Alaska, uh, they've always spoken to the story side. So the kind of work I'm trying to do is, is uh, to let the place and the problem speak to me, to think of the climate as an entity that, that is talking to me, from which I'm trying to learn some lessons. And, uh, and uh, essentially the way I do it for me, because climate is simultaneously local and planetary, is to situate my story in different places around the world and uh, thread those together. And uh, so just to give you a hint, the way that this particular story is working out is that it's really uh, representing two worlds or two future visions of, uh, of a world where uh, we have engaged with climate. And one of them is, one of those worlds is the techno billionaire's dream, very top down and very much uh, continuing the saga of the global north, trouncing the global south, including the north that is in the global south. And, um, and then the other scenario, the other world, the other possible future is a much more uh, complicated and messy world where actually you have bottom up grassroots efforts around the world actually speaking to and influencing and informing the top-down narrative. So, uh, so I guess that's, that's all I'm going to say for now. Plenty there, yeah, absolutely. Well, good, 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 very tantalizing glimpse into what is to come. Um, Hannah, what, will you give us a, a little insight into what you're working on? Okay. Um, basically, the thing I most stabbed me in the face was the oil. I live in the South South, like we talked about earlier. And it's kind of something you can't escape. And for some reason, even though the people who have suffered the most and the areas that have suffered the most 
have in some way benefited, you know, in, you know, there's been some increments in um, revenue to them, scholarships. And what my issue was the land itself, nothing seems to be happening to it. It just seems to be as long as oil is generating so much revenue to Nigeria, then we can forget about whatever happened, you know. Just in, I read, um, an, was it a report in May? Just, uh, we had almost $39 million from May alone, from gas. And, you know, just a month. So it's like the government and <laughs> everyone involved seems to think, look, this is too much money. Every other thing is a casualty and, you know, you don't care. From when oil has been discovered, I don't think any appreciable cleanup has been done in Nigeria. Instead, you have people leaving, moving to cities. Many people move abroad. When they, you know, when these oil companies provide scholarships abroad and everything, a lot of people don't come back. They start, they go and study, and then they, they just, you know, it's like, oh, better life. But what happens to those areas? Is it going to just be like that? And that was where I, <laughs> that was what I narrowed it down to, because I said, you know, <laughs> if the, if it's like this, then why is it that we're on? We're like marking time. Nigeria doesn't seem to be moving on with the rest of the world and it seems to be okay. So I was trying to imagine, okay, if we had to, if something was being done, then what has been done? So I kind of projected it a few years you know, ahead. I was like, okay, let's, 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 let's let it be that some cleanup has been done and there's some other issues that arise from those things. So hopefully, <laughs> and my imagination, let me just give you another hint is, it didn't happen in Nigeria as we have it today, because I couldn't, to be honest, imagine anyone caring enough at this point, you know. It had to be some kind of breakup or something, and then, okay, let's see what we can do. So it was at that point that, okay, things are being done, and if you don't have the so-called people running things, will we be able to do any better if it's just us in this part of Nigeria, you know? That was the story that came to me. Excellent, excellent. I'll be there. I'll definitely be looking out for that one. I'll add it to my my like my Nigerian fiction shelves. <laughs> um, um, Livia, over to you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, I am working currently with the Cumulo de Tesla, which is this collective of uh, scientists and writers and artists, and five of us are uh, collaborating in. Each of us, it's uh, writing like a short story that is uh, connected with the others. And we situated our, our story here in, uh, in Mexico. And we kind of um, uh, proposed that what, our, what if, <laughs> which is one of the basis of uh, science fiction, it's what if one of our main uh, volcanoes uh, erupted and that transforms the atmosphere and the conditions of the soil, et cetera. So we are going forward in time, 50 years, uh, 25 years, 25 years, uh, like uh, in, a, in a family of women uh, starting in 2025, just after the pandemic uh, was uh, surpassed and then uh, going forward into the future. And our, our story, deals with um, migration, with uh, al alimentation and food uh, issues and agriculture issues. Uh, and also uh, we are going to, we are doing something like in a hope punk uh, realm because we're trying to build a fiction in which it doesn't matter how much you have to struggle uh, you you are going to be able to uh, not fix this but survive this and make maybe uh, restart and doing things better. I'm sorry, there is something happening in the street. There is a vendor that is very very loud. So I'm going to put it. my <laughs> well, I'm going to put my headphones because it's, it's getting near. <laughs> it's uh, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, that, this is this is a vendor that is very popular here in the city that it's not a vendor. They they buy uh, old stuff from the houses, like old refrigerators or old beds and stuff, but it's very loud because it has a speaker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, our, our short stories are interconnected. 
And we are working like uh, in a very collective way, which is a, a, a it's it, it, it's very interesting, but it's very it's very nice because uh, we have like an underline, uh, but each of us has a different voice and of course different characters, etc. So um, that is uh, in very general terms how how are we how, how we are working now. Thank you. Um, fascinating um, reflection on how the means of production is absolutely connected with this issue at every level, absolutely every level. We have to find new ways of collaborating, new ways of giving voice to people and to sharing a vision and developing a communal vision. So yeah, it sounds like a great project. Um, we're now going to leave you three for a little while and we're going to go to a short pre-recorded interview I did with Amitav Ghosh last week, um, in which he looks at the challenges that he sees as facing writers and reads from his novel Gun Island, in which a rare book dealer, a linguist and a marine biologist, find the whole weight of colonial history bearing down on a boatload of migrants in the Indian Ocean. Hello, Claire. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Um, I want to get straight down to um, the great derangement. Just give us the what you what you said in that 2016 pamphlet, really, which was so important in this debate. Well, you know, I feel uh, a little bit uh, sort of uh, discombobulated when I hear that it's a sort of call to arms or, a, uh, you know, or a polemic or anything, because they're actually it's really more a kind of introspection. I was trying to sort of ask myself, why is it that I, in my own practice, have been, have, have found it so hard to write about climate events and the climate crisis? And what is it about the form of the novel as such uh, that really resists, uh, you know, something like uh, the climate crisis? So, you know, I point to various aspects, uh, you know, of the form uh, that make it very difficult to deal with, uh, you know, matters like uh, extremely improbable events. And as we know now, <laughs> all these events that are sort of uh, coming at us so fast and furious. Uh, they're all extremely improbable. I mean, the scientists keep saying that, uh, you know, there's a, a one in a thousand year chance of such a flood or of, uh, you know, of such a hurricane or, or such a drought and so on. Two of the themes you, you mention um, is, the, is the ability of the novel to deal with the non-human and also the ability of the novel to deal with the uncanny with coincidence, which seems the, 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 the events which seem beyond our imagination. Can you just uh, explain those two things? Well, <clears throat> you know, the novel has a long tradition of dealing with uh, the uncanny, you know, and the uncanny is very much uh, the realm uh, that we are in. I mean, so many of these events nowadays are, are profoundly uncanny, you know. They suddenly arrive in the middle of, uh, you know, I was just uh, a day before yesterday in Houston, Texas, about to deliver a lecture on um, on climate events and the uncanny and what should happen. But a hurricane <laughs> exploded <laughs> over us at just that time. I mean, these things are just constantly occurring. I mean, you know, there's a section in Gun Island uh, about a wildfire. Uh, approaching um, a museum uh, in uh, in Los Angeles. And that did happen. The Getty Museum had a wildfire coming right at it. But I wrote that part uh, six months before it happened. <laughs> you know, so I mean, one just constantly uh, encounters these sort of weird and improbable uh, events. And of course, uh, fiction has historically been able to deal with many uh, uh, uncanny events of this kind. Uh, you know, there's, a, I don't know if you, if you remember the work of Algernon Blackwood, a Canadian a British writer who wrote wonderful uh, uh, stories of the uncanny and so on. But, uh, you know, the problem is that, uh, you know, that tradition of writing is really regarded as marginal, as a genre, as a kind of, you know, fantasy or horror or something. Uh, and we see now that uh, it's not at all fantastical. It's not at all unlikely. It's just happening all around us all the time. So, so in yes. A way, in a way, what you're talking about is a problem for the literary novelist, because you make the point in The Great Derangement that science fiction writers and fantasy writers and in mediums other than the novel have been dealing with this and with also with the non-human for, for decades. You know, we could talk about um, Terry Pratchett's Discworld. We could talk about um, 
um, the, the um, watership, the watership to the universe. Down. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, that's absolutely true. Uh, you know, um, it is. I mean, the problem really is not so much about what writers do, but rather the literary ecosystem as a whole. Uh, you know, I mean, the writer who writes about those things, I mean, like Algernon Blackwood, if you like, or Richard Adams in writing Watership Down and so on, uh, they're regarded as, uh, you know, fantastical books, they're regarded as uh, something completely extraneous to serious literature. When we talk about the climate crisis, when we talk about, uh, you know, the so-called Anthropocene and so on, we tend to see it as a problem oriented towards the future. Whereas to me, it's, it seems perfectly evident that uh, it's in fact a problem of history. Uh, it's a problem completely rooted in history and especially in colonial history, in the expropriation of resources in the expropriation and indeed extermination uh, of uh, you know, many groups of people by European colonists going back to the 17th century. I think in so many ways, we are really reliving the 17th century, which was also a time of enormous climatic disruption. Now, I want to just finish by asking you to read from Gun Island, a, 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 a particular passage which brings together two of the themes. One of the theme is about how we blame the little guys in the boat trying to get away from the places of maximum devastation. And the other is about this uncanny, these uncanny events that we're all seeing in our everyday life as told in a, in a fictional form. I saw now why the angry young men on the boats around us were so afraid of that derelict refugee boat. That tiny vessel represented the upending of a centuries old project that had been essential to the shaping of Europe. Beginning with the early days of chattel slavery, the European imperial powers had launched upon the greatest and most cruel experiment in planetary remaking that history has ever known. In the service of commerce, they had transported people between continents on an almost unimaginable scale, ultimately changing the demographic profile of the entire planet. But even as they were repopulating other continents, they had always tried to preserve the whiteness of their own metropolitan territories in Europe. This entire project had now been upended. The systems and technologies that had made those massive demographic interventions possible, ranging from armaments to the control of information, had now achieved escape velocity. They were no longer under anyone's control. This was why those angry young men were so afraid of that little blue fishing boat. Through the prism of this vessel, they could glimpse the unraveling of a centuries old project that had conferred vast privilege on them in relation to the rest of their world. In their hearts, they knew that their privileges could no longer be assured by the people and institutions they had once trusted to provide for them. The world had changed too much, too fast. The systems that were in control now did not obey any human master. They followed their own imperatives, inscrutable as demons. So Amtaf, it's a pleasure as always to talk to you. You, you become one of my benchmarks in, in a whole area of thinking that I have to say has opened up since we met. It, I mean, it was post the, the great derangement we met at Hay on Wye. And uh, yes, that's right. I look forward to the next novel. I hope you're not going to forsake it entirely for nonfiction no. and, and, and fable. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> I love writing novels and uh, you know, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Well, a couple of um, really important points there, which I want to address to our panelists. Um, one is uh, we cannot separate the current environmental crisis from 400 years of colonial history. And the second one in terms of writing is the problem is not what writers do as the literary, uh, so much what writers do as the literary ecosystem as a whole. We've, de uh, we've dealt a little bit with, with that one, but um, uh, um, Libya, um, give, give me your, your immediate thoughts about what Amitav was saying. I, I know that I agree completely with him. I am from Mexico, which has been uh, colonialized, not only economically and military, but also ideologically Spain and now <laughs> we are just under uh, the United States and the colonization in a cultural way, it's huge. Now, 
the system, the literary system, to me, it's too capitalist. And that is like, there is a lot of problems. There is a, pro there is a lot of problems about how, uh, how the books are commercialized. So what people understand for literature, high literature or not, what people understand for science fiction or fantasy, many times it doesn't have to do with what we write, but how it's commercialized, how it's labeled, and uh, there is a whole system of ideology that marks that uh, mimetic fiction is higher or superior than the genres of the imagination and science fiction and horror, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a, a, there is a lot of issues around that. And that happens mainly because of the way uh, books are sold because uh, books are sell like, like yogurts. Books are sell like, like they have an expiring day. And if you don't sell a lot of books the first week, you are doomed. And there is, I don't know, I can talk about this for hours. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm gonna try to be like more, uh, more focused because it's a topic very important to me. I have a project that is uh, an editorial project here in Mexico that is independent, that is, uh, and it's, uh, we are not using copyright, we are using copy far left, which means we are uh, liberating our content. And that is, uh, for me, we have to deal with a lot of issues. And in science fiction, um, there is a lot of community. And I like, uh, I like that very much because I think uh, science fiction writers, fantasy writers, uh, horror writers, speculative and, and imaginative writers, uh, know how it is to be like the underdog in a way, but uh, parallel to that, there is exactly the other phase that is because it's a literary genre that can be very, very uh, commercialized, like very, very successful in, in economic terms. Uh, there is like a double, like a double standard for one in one side is I want to publish these stories because they sell a lot. But the other side of the same coin is this fiction sell a lot, but it's not too good. So we are not going to take it so seriously. We're just going to produce in mass. So I don't know. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think that has to do also with how uh, sometimes these genres are perceived. Um, but I think a lot of people that reads and writes these uh, such genres uh, has a better understanding about how this literature, <clears throat> sorry, how this literature can be like seeing beyond the commercial labels and beyond uh, the issues, the economical issues that uh, that are embedded in the literary commercial system. And that's why I think indie houses are very, very, very important. And it's very important that writers understand that for instance, copyright does not protect the writer, protect the people that sell books, which is very, very different. And I'm gonna shut up now because it's a, yeah, it's a huge theme. Yeah, and, and, and projects like this one, this imagination project that you're involved in are really important as well, which support writers in their exactly. endeavor without, one, without selling being the, the, the immediate aim. Um, now, Absolutely. before I move on to our next um, panelist, um, Hannah, I'm going to just reiterate that we'll be taking questions quite soon. And so please leave them in the form below the video. Um, and we want to have lots of lovely, lively questions. Um, Hannah, um, how, how did you, what did you get out of Amitabh's? Um, well, just to follow up on what Libya said, you know, when we talked about literature from Africa earlier on, this is part of what, you know, the, the, limit, the limiting factor of gatekeepers, you know, trying to dictate what they, they are interested in. So you have people, it's not like there's a, there's a dearth of ideas or themes, or plots, you know, it's like saying, oh, from Africa, they want to, you have this, what, I don't know if you've heard the poverty porn thing, that, oh, that's what you should be writing about. You have a whole lot of war, you have poverty, you have a lot of things that, that what they feel that other people would like to, you know, read about. So I think that's a limiting thing on what people have to say, on what authors and writers have to say. So the ecosystem that he talked about, I totally agree with, because it, it, it kind of, there's no balance. Then you have from this side of the world, this is what we want because we're in charge. We're the ones, you know, publishing and we're the ones that can make you a success, you know. So it, it puts a limit on what people <laughs> and what writers from these parts 
would really want mm -hmm. to put out there. But of course, like mm -hmm. we're saying, there are a whole lot of spaces opening up for writers to just write what they want to write and the message, whatever message they want to put in their work. The other thing about colonization, we are Nigeria too, we have, we've, been, we have been colonized and we're still suffering all that. Not only in the sense of the ideolo ideologies like Libya also mentioned, but you know, when you're trying to, in Nigeria, for instance, we're a very diverse country and you have, you put some people together and you kind of give some kind of prescription as to who should be in charge and who is supposed to benefit and how things should be run. Believe me, even with the colonial is gone, in quotes, those so-called prescriptions are still holding sway. You know, it's like saying, oh, we, this, part of, this part of Nigeria, we are supposed to be in power because, you know, the British, <laughs> no offense, you know, the British, when they were here, this is what they, they you know, they, they thought we could do it better. And you have all that going on, which affects the politics and affects what people, what, what's happening in, 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 in the oil regions too. So you have like, for instance, as an example, the oil producing states in the South South, which have been producing oil for quite some decades. You have a few, I think they found oil in the North, but you have these bills that come out in, 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 um, in the House of Assembly and all that. And they say, oh, whatever is from the South should be shared among all the states, but those in those states, whatever gold they find or whatever oil they kind of extract and, you know, they don't, it just stays where they are. So there's no, there's, there's a, that's the double standard we're also talking about. And it also affects how people see these messages and they say, oh, well, climate is not for us. We have a way of doing things that works. It works because they're benefiting from it and they're making a lot of money from it. Not necessarily that the marginalized people are, you know, getting any improvement in their way of life or livelihood. Really, that's how it is, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Vandana, um, um, Hannah um, raised a couple of things, which is one is, um, you know, people dismiss it as poverty porn. Um, and I think that there is, a, you know, this touches on the whole issue of, of why, we're, why we look at these stories of, of really huge distress and also what effect it has on us as readers. So do we get compassion fatigue? And, I, and then leading on from that, um, I, I have a bit of a thing going on in my head about dystopian fiction and how dystopian fiction in a way has become a sort of cosy crime. It's like cosy crime, which we, as we, we call it in, in England, where, where you know, you, it, the, the thrill of safe fear, the thrill of something bad happening to other people. Um, do you think that these are, are potential risks? That's for Vandana. Definitely. Um, I think uh, I do have a problem with not dystopian fiction per se, as part of an ecosystem, perhaps as, you know, where, where you're warning people or where, you know, they're cautionary tales, they have their place. But unfortunately, what we are seeing is we're seeing a lot more dystopian fiction in, uh, about the climate and, you know, various other disasters than we are seeing the kinds of fictions we need to shift our perspectives, to free our imaginations, to help us work through the hell on earth that, that has been created by the super powerful uh, at our expense. Uh, so that is really a problem with dystopia. And I think one of the other things that it misses, uh, which is something that I've learned from, uh, partly from scholarly work and a lot from activists working with grassroots uh, marginalized communities, is that it's not just that marginalized communities have a disproportionate share of having to deal with climate impacts and also with uh, essentially destructive so-called development. And that which is one of the enduring legacies of colonialism, speaking as another person who comes from, you know, as an Indian writer of science fiction and, and speculative fiction. Uh, you know, it's my family stories, generational stories have to do with British rule as well. So, um, so uh, it's the, the, what they miss when uh, people write this kinds of dystopian fiction that you might call, uh, you know, kind of poverty porn or whatever, uh, is that people in these marginalized communities, because they live outside the paradigm of modern industrial civilization, have had to use their creativity to survive the ongoing apocalypse that they have always suffered for generations. Um, and actually have some of the most brilliant perspectives and creative ideas and spirit 
that can actually inform and inspire what we do. So when we take a more complex uh, lens to, the, to this issue, then, then I think there's, there's a lot that we can learn from marginalized communities. And therefore that changes story, that changes story uh, and where we are not sitting apart at a distance and you know, uh, suffering compassion fatigue, but instead are being uh, inspired, humbled um, and, and decentered from old ways of thinking about the climate crisis. Yeah, that's, um, that's that, that whole thing of being decentered. I think that is absolutely crucial, it, whether one is writing from perspectives, other people's perspectives, or even from perspectives outside the human. Oh, yes. <laughs> how, how do we do this? <laughs> um, now, I, I, I just want to remind people one more time to leave your questions. We're about to come to question time. But I would like to bring Ed um, back in. Ed, if you wouldn't mind, um, to. To, because you're coming from a, 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 inside the academy about this, um, what, 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 what do you see as the, as the, the exciting developments? So I think I've, it's been wonderful hearing uh, everybody's contributions. I think there are a few things. First, the, the, the business as usual people are having a, a harder and harder time pretending that it's business as usual. If you're, and if you're uh, a writer of literary fiction today, uh, you know, a, a literary realist. What is literary realism? How are you, you have to write about climate. This is just the world we live in. You know, the future is pouring into the basement. The future is raining down on us. It's happening all around us. And it's getting harder and harder to ignore. And we've been working on climate related projects for, for years now, almost a decade at the Center for Science and the Imagination. And the conversation has shifted. It's no longer so important to convince people to pay attention to climate. People everywhere are paying attention to climate now. The question becomes, what are we going to do? People feel helpless. Uh, people feel frustrated, disempowered, or they feel stuck in a normative, uh, you know, some sort of inertia that has been carrying us this far to say, well, I, yeah, I can, I can do some recycling, you know. And so, how do we, how do we give people pathways forward to, to do exactly what uh, Vandana was saying to build these imaginative bridges and to learn from different perspectives? So that is what I think is really exciting about this project. And this does feel like a moment when the world is finally starting to grapple with this question in a more profound way. Uh, and just the energy and enthusiasm that we've, we've uh, had around this project, you know, uh, partners, not just in the British Library, delighted to be here, uh, the UN high-level climate champions, uh, Vandana is gonna be speaking at TED's Project Countdown, which is a climate event they're holding later this year, the Hay Festival, uh, uh, journals and, and academic audiences uh, and communities all around the world who are reaching out, uh, getting in touch with us because they're excited about this. People really need hope. They're searching for these positive futures. We have this very disaffected relationship with the future. And that is what we're trying to change. It's so important in the, in the context of climate. And that's been uh, what people have always responded to in our work is, oh, you mean I can actually have a positive relationship with the future. I can be hopeful about this. It's, it's okay to take some of these creative risks and actually think about what we might want instead of just wringing our hands and worrying about all the bad things that might happen. Uh, people desperately need that. Uh, so that I think is the moment we're at is to then say, how do we catalyze that into real action? How do we tell these stories and then inspire change today? Mm. I, I was talking the other day with the um, Turkish writer, Eli Shafak, who is talking about making the distinction between passive hope and active hope. And passive hope can be complacency, and we don't have any time for complacency. So how do we commute that into active hope where we're actually putting up the building blocks that will, you know, will enable us to take one step further along that hope pathway? <laughs> yeah, okay, brilliant. Um, so now I think the questions are beginning to come in, so I'm going to start posing them to the panel. Um, the first one from um, Mai or May, thank you very much for your question, is in The Dispossessed, Ursula Le Guin carefully navigates the limits and fallacies of the idea of utopia. How do you approach utopia dystopia in the politics of your speculative fiction? Now, we have touched a little bit of, on this in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, the bit that was just gone before, but I was wondering, Libya, if you'd like to say anything about this? Well, I think those are two labels that are kind of old fashioned right now because we are uh, building new ways of telling stories and to separate literature in dystopia and utopia, it's like uh, reduce it a little bit. I think Ursula K. Le Guin made a fantastic 
job in the dispossessed. And it is, uh, I, I don't remember exactly if it is an imperfect uh, utopia or a ambiguous utopia, but the thing is, uh, I think a friend of mine also, also cites uh, China Mayville that said, uh, there is no dystopia without hope. And in every utopia, there is rage, you know? You cannot have hope if you're not enraged with uh, the bad, the, 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 how bad, <clears throat> sorry, how bad things are right now. And we need hope, but that doesn't mean complacency, as you said. We need to fight, but not in a, in a, um, uh, I'm sorry, English is my second language and sometimes my brain kind of like <laughs> shut down. So uh, the thing is that we need hope, but we need to engage with things. We need to engage. If we are writing stories, we need to engage. We need to be responsible of, of how can we really engage to make some changes, even if it is recycling or writing stories or uh, voting for the right people and whatever it is. So dystopia and utopia are just labels, but are not ex not ex exclusions. Uh, uh, there are not like, if, if I say I am uh, making something towards a hope, it doesn't mean automatically that I am writing a, a, a utopia in an absolute term. I think I, I think right now science fiction, it's mixing uh, hope with pain and despair because life is like that. So it's not just utopia versus dystopia. It's more like building new ways of, of writing stories. And uh, and uh, I think Ursula K. Le Guin like pointed that even in the 60s. Mm -hmm. I am writing a utopia, but it's not perfect. And it's not, uh, it's not deterministic. It's just one way of doing things. It's a laboratory. And in the book, you see how things are not perfect and that is okay. And I, I just uh, very quickly, I recommend that you read a, a short story that she wrote 10 years later that is called The Day Before the Revolution in which Odo herself is the protagonist as an old woman. And that is a brilliant short story that completely turns around uh, the, the whole, the dispossessed uh, ideology in the, in the better way. So uh, yeah, <laughs> there's that. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And somebody, you really know your Le Guin, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I love her. I love her. She's my same matron. She's a goddess. She is a goddess. It has to be, it has to be absolutely said, yes. Yeah. Um, Hannah, I'm going to turn to you from this question um, from Sarah, um, which is, can you say more about how capitalist ideologies limit the imagination as well as our response to the climate crisis? Now, this is absolutely germane to the problem of oil in Nigeria, isn't it? As well as to the colonial, the wider colonial history. It is. Well, the thing is, um, when we're talking about money and money and how to make a living or how to, because like what I'd also talked about in, in some earlier panel is without the oil, where would we be? And even for years, okay, say so it's gonna run out someday. You have to think about that. You have to focus a lot on agriculture. And even be, before colonialism, we had groundnut farming in the North. There was cocoa in the West. But when the oil just came in, it kind of just ground to a standstill. We have, we have industry and steel industries. Well, steel is one of those things. But a lot of these manufacturing things, things that we could hold on to as a country, or say outlets where we're manufacturing, we're doing this, just kind of ground to a halt. And we have to now look at, are we, when we're talking about the, 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 what um, success has become, especially in the West and those ideologies that have been passed down to us, what are we going to take? Is it going to be just making the money and then at the detriment of us and we're not going to be here forever or our children or the land? Like I said, you have a lot of land that's just lying there and it's like we've said, oh, goodbye to you land and there's no hope. So it's, it's that kind of, where does the balance come in? And I think like Wandana said, a lot of those, things that we were doing early on before all colonialism came or you know came on board and are the kind of things we have to return to maybe on some level not like we're going to just give up and you know go back to the old ways and you know start living without some of these conveniences but I think if we want to really make a mark in our little ways 
and make a difference. We have to get rid of this idea of success and what what is a, the entrappings really of what it means and <laughs> move forward because it's, it's if we keep doing the same things and we're not making any, especially in this country, you know, I know a lot of other places are making moves and steps. Sometimes there's a lot of rhetoric here. Oh, let's do something. Oh, we have this committee. We're going to set up a committee to look at the ecosystem. Like two months ago, the governor here, oh, a committee for the ecosystem, do something. And I was wondering how much of that is really going to translate to actual practice. What was what next? Are we going to hear about it? Are people going to be brought on board? There's a Ministry of Environment here, but it's almost like they don't exist to some extent. And then you have people saying, oh, they're encouraging Shell, I'm calling an oil company, encouraging Shell to clean up the canal. And I'm like, should it be about persuasion or there should be a policy? This is our country and this is how this is how business should be run. You have to do this, not like kind, kind of cajoling you to, oh, please, can you clean up the canal because you're making money and we're both making money. You know, those are the questions that come out of these things. So I think somehow along the line, it has to be what is more important to us, you know, and then to forget greed. You know, money is important, but really at a point, it's not going to take us anywhere alone. Thank you. Uh, so, so linked, slightly linked to that, uh, but also, also sort of touching on some of Ursula Le Guin's writing, actually, um, particularly her carrier bag fiction, uh, theory of fiction, uh, which will make Livia smile, I know. I know. Um, there's a question from Mary, which I want to put to Vandana, which is, especially in fantasy, the plot features a single hero and a single big bad, and a single big bad. Does the panel think our frequent consumptions of stories that use these tropes have contributed to the feeling of hopelessness surrounding climate action? Because there is no one big bad and no one group of rebels or chosen or a chosen one that can affect change. Uh, that's a very smart question, isn't it? It's, it's a bit of a carrier bag question. Vandana. Yes, that's a brilliant question. Thanks to Mary for asking it. Uh, yes, indeed. I think that that lone hero narrative uh, is really destructive to our sense of agency and our imagination, because we always are waiting for somebody to come and do the stuff for us. You know, like uh, for instance, when I start talking about climate change to my students, often, um, or, you know, in the early part of the class, the, the kind of responses I elicit include things like, well, technology is gonna save us, or those guys are gonna do this or whatever. Uh, so that, that lack of agency, especially collective agency, which is one of the problems with capitalism because it breaks relationships. That's how it works. It, it works by breaking relationships. Uh, I think that's, that's a major issue. And that's one of the reasons why I try to write about multiple people in multiple places around the world, uh, as I did, for instance, in a project for uh, uh, that, that Ed headed as well, uh, which is a story called Entanglement, uh, which is set in five different places around the world. And they kind of uh, linked together in some way. The, uh, and in, in, there's a line from that story, which I'm quoting myself without, uh, just from memory, but something to the effect that the age of the lone hero, the, the lone ranger hero is over. And now we are entering the, ra uh, the age of a million heroes and more than a million really. So, so that's the exciting thing that we now, if we can, if we can decenter ourselves from the lone ranger narrative, um, and which you know, is based on social hierarchy. If you think about that, it's a pyramidal way of thinking about the world rather than thinking about the world as a, as a web. Um, so if we can separate ourselves from that and then think about uh, what, what, who we are and, and what we can do within our networks of influence and beyond, and especially through literature, uh, then, then there's something to that. And I think Ursula Le Guin, uh, her works really showcase uh, what the, the individual spirit within a collective network can do uh, to change things, to, uh, to effect social change. Um, and and so, so I would, I thank you for that question. It's brilliant. It was a great question. Libya, can I just nip back to you uh, about this carrier bag theory of fiction? Do you think that holds out now? I was so struck by it when I first heard about it. I find it so touching, but I wonder whether it's, we could, we need to find a different metaphor now. I don't know. I don't know if it is there is a better metaphor because I think it carries now. And 
I don't know. I just remember like in a, like in a sideways, a philologist that I knew, that I used to know, she said that language, it's like an old lady carrying a lot of uh, like uh, pots and spoons and stuff for living and the, naturally uh, gets rid of what is not useful anymore because it's very economical. In that regard, I think there is like a connection because uh, stories, as I was saying in the in the like in the beginning, evolve. So uh, that idea of uh, stories kind of evolving by themselves and adapting to the times, it's um, it's a testament that the the carrier back <laughs> it's uh, it's still um, it's still current. Because you don't carry things that you don't need. You just carry things. If, if you are uh, walking, if you are migrating, you just carry things that are useful. So literature can be that also. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I think I think it's I think it's, it's still current. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, we we're, we're obsessing a bit about we're, we're becoming fangirls, aren't we? Ursula Le Guin fan club. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a question from Sophia, which I'd like to put to Hannah. Um, what is your message for novice writers, of those who don't see themselves as fiction or those who don't see themselves as fiction writers? How can we claim the narrative back from the multi-million dollar dystopia stories in Hollywood, Netflix and all the bestsellers? Um, and there's a small plug at the end for a cli-fi for beginners during lockdown. Um, <laughs> which is called www.withmanyroots.com, Cli-Fi Imaginarium, which sounds quite worth visiting. Hannah, what's okay. your <laughs> novices? Well, I think like for any writer in any climb or whatever theme, not just for speculative fiction, is to keep plugging at it, I think, and to read, like they say, as widely as possible. And I think there's the courage sometimes to go with your gut, you know, sometimes, when we, are, we, we forget about, oh, this is what's, in, what's trending and all that. And if you have something, if you have a message you want to, you want out there, then you, you, you go for it and write it. Every, it's, it's just a journey. I think every way is just about keep, you keep going, you keep writing and then try and tamp down. I think there's always fear somewhere about how, how would this be received? And will I have, will anybody be interested? You know, you don't want to be laughed at. For me, I do a lot of short story writing and sometimes you just have to close your eyes and send it out, you know. <laughs> it might be rejected, but the more you grow, the more courageous you are at these things, you know. You just send it out and you get a rejection. It might feel bad for one hour, but you know, send it out as soon as possible. Even so as we can Here's a question for you. I don't yeah. know which one of you, for all of you. Why are you writing fiction which doesn't get huge audiences? Why are you not <laughs> writing for Netflix? Why are you not <laughs> writing film? Why are you uh, not writing best-selling pop songs on the subject? <laughs> Maybe it might be in our future one day, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Livia, what, what do you think about that? I think uh, if, if I wanted to be a success, I wouldn't be a writer uh, or I wouldn't be a Mexican science fiction writer. I will try to be a, a script writer for, for Netflix, unemployed and sad because nobody picked my stories. It's a very competitive and very capitalist world. And, world. and I, 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 wanted to, I wanted to tell stories and explore ideas. And sometimes there is no direct link between that and economical success. And I think, I think to to write pop songs requires a talent that I don't have. <laughs> Basically, Bandana, how about you? Is there um, a, little, a little a little world breaking screenplay house somewhere well, in the back of your mind? Well, well, we well, I think we all hope that you know our works will get out there to a wider public. And in fact, the science fiction community is a pretty uh, large and enthusiastic bunch of people that really engage with their writers, uh, unlike other, uh, other kinds of literature. Uh, but having said that, I think when uh, I'm compelled to write because I don't seem to be able to stop myself, uh, and I'm compelled to write uh, from, from within, you know, and I have to write the kind of work I write. And if people, you know, if it's not hugely popular, then that's too bad. But on the other hand, I've also been thinking about the importance of 
uh, this sort of writing getting heard because in a way it is also trying to, uh, uh, you know, redress the, uh, the imbalance in, in the literary ecosystem to use that term of Amitabh's. Um, and and so, so, you know, I think that we have to, uh, at least I'm gonna try to bring it out there into older forms, like bring back the oral component in storytelling, which is what I grew up with. I, I grew up hearing uh, stories from my mother and grandmother. So, so there's this uh, other ways to think about it, but certainly, um, you know, it's not, it's not part of my, <laughs> my agenda to, to go to Netflix or Hollywood because I don't think they would necessarily at this stage care for the kinds of things we're writing. And well, that's long, fine. long may it all continue. And um, thank you very much for all your wonderful questions to you in the audience. And thanks very much as well to our Climate Imagination Fellows, Hannah Onugwe, Libya Brenda Vandana Singh, also to Amitav Ghosh and Ed Finn, who made a heroic intervention there. I'm going to leave you with a quote because since we're on, we're on a bit of a, a, an Ursula Le Guin um, thing here, wave here, I'm going to leave you with a quote from that to carry a bag essay, which I carry with me in my heart, which is a novel is a medicine bundle holding things in particular and powerful relation to each other and to us. And I think that that, that is something that we could, we, we, we could, you can meditate, I meditate on it regularly and I hope we all do. So, um, Goodbye and many thanks for listening and for participating. Thank you, Claire. I think we need also to thank you for so expertly leading us and guiding us through this event. Um, and certainly another thank from the British Library and from all our audience, to Hannah and to Lydia and to Randana. Thank you. I've been inspired and humbled uh, and challenged by everything I've heard from you. Um, and our thanks also to Amitav for his video and for Ed and the colleagues uh, from the University of State University of Arizona for, for um, bringing us to this place, really. Uh, it was a very exciting journey. Um, I'm just going to also remind our audience about um, uh, maybe continuing this journey with us for a little while through uh, the uh, project uh, on the postcard from the future. You may have been inspired to start creating your own um, fiction right now and you can uh, you can link uh, through the link at the bottom of the website below the video onto the postcards from the future project where you see some brilliant images by the Brazilian digital artist Shao Quiroz uh, and you can um, you can write your own uh, positive uh, climate fiction a short one uh, for us and post it publicly as well. Um, thank you so much. You can see other videos on the British Library uh, website from this particular series uh, of the natural world. And we thank you very much and goodbye from all of us and uh, the British Library. Goodbye. <laughs>